Constance Adler. Okay. Thanks very much. Um, so welcome to all kinds of memoir. Um, and we have all kinds of memoirists here. Uh, to my right is Beth Ann Benelli, the Poet Laureate of Mississippi, who teaches in the MFA program at the University of Mississippi, where she was named Outstanding Teacher of the, of the Year. She's won grants and awards from the NEA, the United States Artists Pushcart, and a Fulbright to Brazil. Um, Beth Ann has published three poetry books, Open House, Tender Hooks and Unmentionables, a book of nonfiction, Great with Child, and The Tilted World, a novel she co-authored with her husband, Tom Franklin. Her newest book is Heating and Cooling, 52 Micro Memoirs. Um, next to Beth Ann is Anne Gisselson, who um, I should tell you, Anne is the first person I met when I moved to New Orleans 23 years ago, who uh, kind of took me under her wing and really welcomed me and brought me to my first Mardi Gras cross-dressers ball. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to have some good stories to tell, hang out with Anne because things will happen. So Anne's stories have appeared in The Atlantic, The Oxford American, The Believer, Ecotone, The Los Angeles Times, and has been selected for inclusion in several anthologies, including Best American Non-Required Reading. Uh, for years, Anne was the chair of the creative writing program at the New Orleans Center for Creative Arts. In 2005, she co-founded Antenna in New Orleans, wh where she lives. Her, her memoir is The Futilitarians, Our Year of Thinking, Drinking, Grieving, and R Reading, which was published last year. Um, next is, oh, you guys have switched seats. Okay. <laughs> All right, that is definitely Rick Brad. Um, Rick is the author of many best-selling books, including All, All Over But the Shouten, Ava's Man, The Prince of Frogtown, Jerry Lee Lewis, His Own Story, and My Southern Journey. Rick has won a Pulitzer Prize and a Neiman Fellowship for his work as a journalist. C currently, he teaches writing at the University of Alabama. He writes for Garden and Gun magazine, Southern Living, and he lives in Alabama. Forthcoming in April is his memoir, the Best Cook in the World, Tales from My Mama's Table. Next is uh, Minrose Gwynn. Like the characters in her latest novel, Promise, Minrose grew up in Tupelo, Mississippi. She began her writing career as a newspaper and wire service reporter throughout the Southeast. Her civil rights era novel, The Queen of Palmyra, was a Barnes & Noble to discover great new writers pick and a finalist for the John Gardner Fiction Book o Award. Minrose is also the author of cultural and literary studies books that focus on racial injustice, namely re remembering Medgar Evers writing the long civil rights mo movement. She's also co-editor co of the literature of the American South and has taught as a professor at universities across the country, most recently the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her memoir, w Wishing for Snow, tells the story of the convergence of poetry and psychosis in her mother's life. So I, I would like to begin um, by talking, or asking, I should say first, you to talk about the, the various forms that your, that your memoirs take. What, what I noticed when I was reading to get ready for this panel is that you each have um, crafted what I would call a kind of scaffold for the memoir to, to, to hold up the memoir. Uh, in one case, in Rick's case, it's recipes. Uh, in Beth Ann's book, it's very compressed um, prose poems, I guess I'd, we, we would call them. And Minrose wrote about her mother's poem and uh, worked her memoir out through um, meetings of a, of a, um, a book group. And so what I, what I was sort of curious to know about is did you have the material first and then look for a scaffolding to hold it up, or did you start with the form, with the idea of a of a scaffolding, and then shape the material to fit that? And if you wanted to first start just by telling everyone just a few words about what what your book is, so they can know what what you're talking about. Do you want to go first, Bethany? Yeah. Okay, there we go. Um, 
My book before the one I'm here for today was a novel that I wrote with my husband. And it took us four years to write that novel. It was about the flood of the Mississippi River in 1927. And we had to do a lot of research. And then I also got knocked up again, you know. So it took a long time to write that book. And um, when it was over, I thought I would write another novel. But I, I kept not writing a novel. I would go to my notebook and I would just put down like weirdo little thoughts or things I'd overheard or crazy little ideas that were flitting through my head. And I kept waiting for them to add up to something. And then um, one day I thought, oh, I'm so excited to go to my desk and sit down. And I recognized the feeling of when writing is going well before I recognized the writing. So I went to my desk and I started looking through and I thought, what if I stopped waiting for these little things to add up to something and just recognize them as very small things? And I thought, maybe I don't recognize this as writing because it doesn't look like a novel, doesn't look like a poem, doesn't look like an essay. Maybe it's a new thing. So I came up with the term micro-memoir. And once I came up with the term, it helped me think of what I was doing. And I, I asked if it would be okay if I just read one, because they're really short, and it'll give you a sense of, um, <coughs> of what I'm doing. And, and then I'll pass the microphone on. I just thought I'd read the first one in the book, so um, you can kind of hear how short these are. Uh, the shortest one is, is 19 words. But um, some are a couple pages. This is a paragraph. Married love. In every book my husband's written, a character named Colin suffers a horrible death. This is because my boyfriend, before I met my husband, <laughs> was named Colin. In addition to being named Colin, he was Scottish and an architect. So you understand my husband's feelings of inadequacy. My husband cannot build a tall building of many stories. He can only build a story and then push Colin out of it. My book is called The Futilitarians, and the subtitle is Our Year of Thinking, Drinking, Grieving, and Reading, and that's basically, there you have it. That's the, uh, that's the book. Um, and it, the structure, the scaffolding of it, it takes place over a year, and so there are 12 chapters for each month, so January, February, uh, March, et cetera. And um, in the beginning of January 2012, um, like the first week, actually it was the day before the epiphany, we started an existential crisis reading group with some friends because it seemed like people were going through a lot of stuff and just needed something like that. And uh, so we started this group and it was great. We had a really great evening. And then literally the next week, my father died. Um, he had had a long illness, leukemia, but he had kind of rebounded and we were still very surprised by it. And so um, the subsequent meetings of the existential crisis reading group had this kind of extra urgency and depth to them. And um, after about halfway through the year, uh, I realized that, um, that I probably should start writing about these experiences because everything, each of the readings had a special resonance with loss and some other family loss that we had experienced. Um, and also I knew, unlike other very long projects, I had had two long book projects that didn't really go anywhere at all. Um, this one had an end to it, which was December. So. I knew that there was kind of this finite place that I could write towards, and, and it helped me deal with some of the, the, the very difficult subjects that I had never dealt with before, including the, the suicides of two of my sisters years before. So I was, um, so having that, like, it really was a scaffolding in the sense that it allowed me to write something that up until that point had been extremely difficult to, mm -hmm. to write. Um, was the baby Tommy's? Watch his name. He, he looks a lot like you, Rick. <laughs> <laughs> that, is, that is pretty much the final nail in my coffin. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I've always, uh, Southern writers, and, and I think it's hilarious when Southern writers, we were talking about this at lunch, uh, when Southern writers say, I'm not a Southern writer, I think that's just hilarious. You know, like, you know, I talk like this, so what am I going to be? 
<laughs> the great Swiss writer, Rick Bragg. <laughs> but, uh, but I, you know, I, all Southern writers are going to do either a food memoir eventually or a dog book. <laughs> That's just what you have to do. There, there's there's got to be, it's either going to be chicken and dressing or it's going to be a dog. And I plan to do dog book next. <laughs> but uh, I, I knew that I, there are always stories. I mean, those of you, how many of you by show of hands are from the South? Right. Mm -hmm. uh, how many of you ladies have married a Southern man? How many of you got a good one? <laughs> how many of you are lying? So, uh, you know, the stories are, are bottomless, I think. And I, and I do mean that. They're bottomless. And sometimes tragedy is part of that forever fall. And sometimes, you know, it makes you laugh out loud. But the stories are, are you know, they're just bottomless. Every time we sit down to eat, there is a story. And, you know, my mother's memory for 19... 42 is so much better. She can't remember to take her medicine, but she remembers 42, 43, 44. So those are bottomless. The, the, the problem, so that was my scaffold. Mm -hmm. um, the problem was, was believe it or not, you know, I, I wanted it to be a, a real food memoir. So it's a narrative. But again, that was easy. The problem was the recipes because... They're not, they're, they don't make any damn sense. <laughs> you know, I, I said, I, you know, I, I said, Mom, how much did you, how much flour did you use? Well, a handful, but a good handful, which is, <laughs> which is a handful and a half. I did the arithmetic. <laughs> and, 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 you know, how much salt do you use? Well, you know, hon, some. <laughs> what in the hell is some? <laughs> and so, so the real it took five years to do. The, the, the narrative could have been written in a year and a half, two years. The, the recipes took forever. And, the, and people love to say, did you try the recipes? Well, hell no, I didn't try the recipes. I'm afraid to. <laughs> and, and, and if we can, if we can, you know, they said, what do you want to have happen with this book? You know, people love to say, what, what do you want to have happen? And, I, you know, and they want me to say, you know, I hope it changes the world. You know? <laughs> and, and instead, I just thought, you know, I just don't want to poison anybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm not going to, I'm not going to make those things. I'm scared of them. <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, well, the... In answer to your question, the materials um, really um, made my memoir what it is. Um, the, um, this is about the memoir, Wishing for Snow, was about my mother's, it's about my mother's mental illness. And, and my mother in her 50s, uh, she was always extremely eccentric person. And people would go, oh, here comes Erin Taylor. Let's get out of here. Uh, but um, she devolved into mental, serious mental illness in, in her 50s. Interestingly, at the same time that she started taking courses at Ole Miss, um, driving the 50 miles from Tupelo to, um, to Oxford to take courses in the creative writing department, and starting to write some pretty incredible poetry. And so these two things happened at the same time. And uh, so it was hard. I was in my 30s at the time, and it was hard for me to know how to, to uh, help her. And I think, you know, in the, in the looking back on it, I was really a dismal failure at helping her, but also the mental health facilities and and, and uh, doctors were also a, a dismal failure in helping her. 
And so my memoir is really about my trying to come to terms with uh, her, her, the late, latter part of her life. She died. Uh, she didn't kill herself. She tried to many times, uh, but she uh, finally died of cancer. Um, after telling me that um, about a year before her death that she never wanted to see me again and would um, never let me visit her in, in mental institutions and so forth. So um, as you might imagine, this is a very difficult um, uh, time for me after her death. And so I started writing the, the book uh, not knowing it was a book, I was just simply pouring out my heart over this really terrible situation and my inability to um, deal with it in a way that would really, really help her. And uh, my guilt and, and grief uh, about this. Uh, but then uh, when she died, uh, certain materials came to me from my stepfather, uh, her poetry, uh, uh, some of which had not been published. She was publishing in journals at the time of her death, but, uh, well, not at the time of her death, but, you know, when she went through this period uh, earlier. And, um, and so um, I, I started thinking, I need to have her voice in this memoir, too. It doesn't just need to be my voice. It needs to be her voice. So I started inserting some of her poems in, the, in my book, and writing kind of toward those poems and away from those poems. But then I thought, oh my goodness, you're appropriating your mother's poetry for your own memoir, you know? Uh, you must uh, collect this poetry and put out a book. So I did that. I stopped everything and I did that. Then though, um, the thing that was really helpful to me was when my stepfather died, I received a copy of her diary when she was eight years old, a little girl growing up in Mississippi when she was eight years old. And she uh, was always wishing for snow. And to me, that seemed to capture uh, the, her personality more than any other thing, that she was a woman and a girl, but growing up in a certain period in which she really did not have um, uh, access, in a sense, to a lot of the things that I had access to at, at my in a generation later. And so um, what I did was I inserted these little snippets from her eight-year-old diary at the beginning of each chapter, in addition to her poetry in the, in, in, in the volume. And so um, that, that gave it much more structure and also this kind of driving voice of hopefulness that my mother had and creativity that she had of always imagining something uh, that was truly kind of impossible or at least if it did snow in Tupelo, it was going to melt, you know, <laughs> in three minutes. So anyway, that's my, that's my story. It's interesting because that's something that your book and Rick's book have in common is that it, the books almost read like a conversation between the narrator and the mother character. Um, and what I found kind of interesting, Minrose, about your book is that actually the mother's voice in the poems actually sounds very different from the mother's voice in the text of the story. It's almost as though it, there's more than one personality in that in, in that person. And I, I wondered if you could talk about that a little bit, the layering of, of persona. And Rick, your, your mother's voice is just very strong th throughout. It's just very, um, very clearly her from, ch from chapter to chapter. But I'm She's sorry. smarter than I am. <laughs> Yeah, my mother was smarter than I than I am too. Um, <coughs> as as to um, as to the diversity of her voice mm -hmm, voices, mm -hmm. um, I also, in addition to these, um, in addition to these written things of hers, I created a mother. I always felt when I was writing this memoir that my mother was on my shoulder. Uh, whispering in my ear, or shouting in my ear, kind of like uh, Virginia Woolf always wrote that that the angel in the house, the the uh -huh. perfect uh, woman of her period, was always on her shoulder, uh, whispering in her ear, and she had to kick the angel of the house out. 
Um, but I, I tried to give that a voice, uh, her a voice too, and I called her the Aaron on the futon because I had a futon in my in my writing um, room at home, and um, it served as an extra bedroom, and so um, my mother was uh, always sitting on there correcting me as I, as I was writing the memoir, and I, I brought that voice in too. Uh -huh. So the yeah, she was. She uh, was diagnosed finally as paranoid psychosis, with paranoid psychosis, but she did have many different voices and I was trying to catch her. Mm -hmm. So Rick, do you feel as though you were recording a private conversation with your mother or, were, or when you record her voice in your book, do you feel as though you're introducing her to strangers and let that, what, what is your sense of well, that? Well, the, the, I guess the, I guess the introduction came Century ago, when oh, right. we did mm -hmm. all over the shout thing, and people kind of fell in love with her, you know. And um, I'm very lucky, and my mama is still with us, you know. She's she, you know, but she had me young. She's only 81, so she's, you know. But she, um, the reason I did this was because she had gone through a terrible. She's almost six feet tall, and she was 25 and a quarter. So, you know, so she was, we almost lost her. And um, I've gotten um, used to having a voice in my life. And so the reason for going back to that particular well was because, you know, the same reason that old quarterback I know that she and I, you know, my mama don't live forever. She's going to be 115 and throwing sticks of firewood at my dog. <laughs> you know, I came home the other day and she doesn't like my dog and she was throwing little sticks of firewood at him off the porch. And for an 81-year-old woman, she can sidearm a stick of firewood. <laughs> I mean, she, but uh, but I, I walked into her kitchen when she was in the hospital and, and at that time, into the kitchen, and it just occurred to me, this is old and empty and quiet, and it's never been in my lifetime old and empty and quiet. And I thought about, um, you know, I thought about like birds on a, on a wire, and how you look at them, and there's all this life and vibrancy on the wire, and then when they fly off, it's just this black line on the sky. That was what that felt like in that room, just a black line of, you know, of counters and stoves. So, uh, you know, it, it was a chance for me, because we don't run out of stories, it was a chance for me to, to deliver those stories. The vehicle, the recipes were almost, I thought they'd be inconsequential, but man, you can't write everything. You actually have to try. And, but I, I wanted her voice to have one more beat, and uh, and that's why I kind of stuck it out. And I didn't expect it to be 500 pages of big picture, <laughs> so I might have gotten carried away. I, I was very intrigued, Rick, by your book that the the recipes originated not with a distant matriarch, but with the patriarch. That it, yeah. it rightly or wrongly, we I expect the recipes to come down through the line of. Yeah. Mothers, but it didn't. It came from a great great grandfather. Yeah, my my <coughs> great great grandfather's name, he, and I'm not making this up. His name was Jimmy Jim Burnham. He had two first names, <laughs> and Jimmy Jim, and he he was uh, he, and there's no way to sugarcoat it. He killed one of them. Um, he also bit this fellow's finger off one time and brought it home and put it on the mantel. And, uh, but 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 he 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 killed this man at a place called the Mill Ranch. Again, a, a wonderful story of the ghost haunting that mill branch, you know. And he killed this man. He had to flee. So he went to Georgia, and up in the mountains of North Georgia. And my grandfather, his son, in the meanwhile, he was my great grandfather, uh, married my grandma Ava, and, and she could not cook. And 
he was skinny to begin with, and he just became emaciated. I mean, she saw mm-hmm. no point. She mm-hmm. didn't eat because she was a little bird-like mm-hmm. woman. You know, those people that say, you know, I just forgot to eat. <laughs> and, and she, he was starving. And, and, he, and he, he started getting women in the county to come and try to teach her to cook. And she was so strong-willed and a little bit crazy that she ran them all. And she was very, very, very petulant, angry, little mean, nasty little woman walking around, but, but pretty, <laughs> which is why America. <laughs> and this story has an end. And, uh, and uh, my grandfather finally said, there, there's maybe one person in the whole world who is mean enough and tough enough to cook, and is a great cook. So he got on his mule and he rode into the mountains of Northville. He took a day, two days, and hunting for his fugitive father. And he found him. And, you know, he said, the daddy looked at him. He's sitting next to a lean-to. He'd been living like an animal. And he, he looked at his boy and he said, son, you look thin. My grandfather said, yes, Daddy, for I have married a beautiful woman who cannot cook, and I am starving to death. <laughs> and his daddy took pity and went back down the mountain on back of the mule. It's a gray mule, I was told. You get that right. And, uh, and that old man and that young woman thawed and thawed and purged, and, but eventually became friends and they cooked. So I knew when I had, I started this memoir before I had that story, but when I got that story, because my people don't tell their stories in order, (laughs) but when I got that story and every writer knows and every reader knows what this is like, there's that moment when you get that one nail seated up good Mm -hmm. and you know the whole wall can hang on it. Mm -hmm. And that's when it goes. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to take that. Well, given that, as we've, as you pointed out, and as we all know, that the stories are bottomless, I'd like to know how you make choices about what to include and what, and what to, and what to leave out. I mean, you can't possibly include everything. There's always a sifting process. And besides, life is too um, disorganized. It's not, it's not a work of art. You have to make a work of art out of, out of it. So how do you sift through the material that you have and make choices about what's going to go in the memoir, <coughs> what will go in the memoir and what won't? Do you have any? Um, I'm sure everyone has a different um, story behind that. For me, one of the things I was trying to do in this book was um, dignify the smallest moments of our lives. <laughs> and um, I'm interested, in, of course, in our great stories and the, the big arcs, but sometimes I feel like um, our life, like, I'm a small life in a way. Like I'm just living in a small Mississippi town. I'm a mom of three. I go to work every day. You know, there shouldn't be any drama in my life. But even in the, like a single day, there can be moments of such like weirdness or mystery or confusion. But we go through life so fast and there's so much noise around us all the time that I feel like if, if only we could clear away the, the noise and the clutter to see the moment for what it is, and so that's what I was trying to do with, like, the white space on the page is to, um, you know, find these little experiences that happen in my life and really everyone's life that um, are s- reveal to us the mystery of human nature, like what, what we're doing here on Earth. That sounds a little grandiose because they're really small moments. But um, I think that um, finding the short size was one of the things that helped me find um, the emphasis. Um, so the form was working with content in that way. Mm-hmm. In terms of what not to include, um, you know, really, I just wanted to write everything, and then I had to cut it way down. My friend read an early draft. I had 100 pieces. It ended up being 52 micro-members, but 100, and she said, well, it's exuberant. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, um, I come up against that problem all the time because I have a lot of brothers and sisters, and there's also a lot of people. In it. It's a very, like, heavily peopled book. For a little, little kind of small book, there's a lot of people in it. And um, 
you know, recently I'll get some like, and most of my family, they're, they're totally fine with it, but I'll get some middle of the night text about, you know, like, why didn't you include this? Like, you needed to tell the truth, and why didn't you include this thing? And I'm like, man, it's like, this is about like my issues and my hangups um, and the stuff that like I have to do. Like, I can't deal with everybody's stuff. <laughs> Um, and so just kind of like narrowing it down to um, having these like monthly works of literature, whether it was John Cheever or Liz Spector or whomever, um, and uh, just kind of like focusing in on that one issue and then kind of like going out from there and whatever, uh, whatever kind of family anecdotes or um, other thoughts or things that were happening. There's a lot of New Orleans in it. It's, you know, it's very much kind of a post-Katrina existential um, book as well. Uh, just kind of like using that as the magnet and for each for each chapter. And so that helped me organize greatly because I knew like I couldn't put in everything about all these people or even about the, the family history. So I had to just focus in on what what I was trying to work through with each of these these works. And that that was extremely, extremely helpful. You just used the part that was there. <laughs> Gwen Rose, uh, Min Rose, did you want to say something? I've, I've kind of forgotten the question. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. <laughs> what was the question? How do you make decisions <laughs> about what to put in the memoir and what to leave oh, out? Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, I'm sorry. No, I, okay. This is my second panel in a row, so uh, I'm, I'm a little low on sugar, even though I ate two brownies before I came in here. Um, Somebody get this woman another brownie and, <laughs> yeah. and, and bring her some extras. I need, I, I, yeah. <laughs> I need some of Rick's mother's uh, cooking here. Um, I, uh, I think that, yeah, I mean, it, it absolutely. Um, I, I see my, my memoir is kind of a spiral, uh, you know, it, I'm kind of, I had kind of a visual m um, sense of things and so it kind of a spiral because it's not in any kind of chronological order at all it mm -hmm. it just goes from one one episode to another episode and then memory will kick it back mm -hmm. um, but one thing that um, uh, kind of gripped me by the throat in the middle of writing it was I felt I felt you need to write about your own self as a mother you know, your mother wasn't perfect by any means, but neither are you. <laughs> and, um, and, and so I, I started um, thinking about, I started uh, thinking about my daughter by then was in college uh, when I was writing this book, but I was thinking about how uh, I had, you know, I think parents uh, always fail their children in some, in some ways, you know. Uh, we're all human, and we, I think we all do. And so my material kind of gripped me by the throat in that case and mm -hmm. said, hey, you know, you need to critique yourself if you're going to critique her mothering, which I was doing mm -hmm. in part of the memoir. Mm -hmm. um, you need to cr critique your own mothering, too. Let's be fair, fair and square here. You know, there, there's something that I read um, a couple of days ago that I think pertains to memoir, which is um, there is a there have been some archaeological digs going on in the in the French Quarter recently, and one that I that I read about the the people who were doing the excavation um, were digging down underneath a building that had been standing there for more than two two hundred years, and so they were looking into soil that hadn't been touched in over two two hundred years, and as they dug down about seven feet or so, they would encounter layers of soil that would um, correspond to certain moments in the history of the French Quarter. And at one point, they hit a layer of ash that corresponded to the fire that happened in 1788, I think, that almost leveled the entire French Quarter. And the people who were doing the digging said that when they got to that layer of ash, they could actually smell smoke. That, um, that, and I just thought, how does a smell stay underground for 230 years? I just, I was so struck by, by, by that. And it occurred to me that that is what memoirs do, that you, you just sort of start digging in, in, into your own soil. Um, so you go looking for it. You go looking for the past. But every so often, the past just seems to rush 
rushed to you in this very visceral way. And, I, and I'm wondering if you ever had an, an experience like that when you were working on your, your, your memoirs where something just came to you that you w weren't expecting or that just grabbed you, as you say, grabbed you by, by the throat. Or were there other, did, did, did the others of you ever have an experience like that? Where, where a, a memory wanted to be written about that you hadn't, it hadn't occurred to you that you would write, write about? I think the people that you're writing about, um, um, you know, writers a lot of times become writers because it's the only job that's pretentious enough to <coughs> allow them to pursue sucking in oxygen. And I think we want to, it's always a journey of self-discovery. I found that Memoirs really tell you exactly what they want to tell you. Mm -hmm. They tell you exactly what they want to tell you. They tell you the volume of it. <coughs> they tell you the depth of it. They tell you the, the, they, the pain that they release, is the amount of pain that they want to release to you. I'm not being cynical about it. Mm -hmm. you know? And often that is very dead on. You know, often that is very accurate. new book is somewhat, it's still got plenty of grit in it, you know, it's death and dying and fighting and killing and loving, and, but there's, um, you know, the, the first book, you know, a quarter century ago was, you know, my mama was my hero because my daddy was not, and, and I tried to dance around. His cruelty. I, you know, I try very hard to to be vague, not to plumb the depth, but to be vague because I thought that being vague and bland, where those cruelties were concerned and that violence was concerned. I mean, this is a man who killed a Chinese soldier in Korea by holding his head up with a pit. So, you know, who raised fighting dogs with a pit? So, I. I tried to, 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 to spare my mom in the memoir by being vague. And, and she read it, and she liked it, but she pointed it that, that one page and said, you make it sound like he is mean to me all the time. And what I'd done was I'd done what I think Hank Williams did for my people. I'd, I'd pounded it out, not to put myself on a plane in my mother but you know, he kind of pounded out our grief till we could stand it. And I was trying to do that in the book to make it smooth enough and thin enough to where we could stand it. And she said, no, that, that, I think that, and this is my mom who went sixth grade, said that misleads people. And I said, let, let me tell you a story. And the story was, um, your daddy had a bunch of homeless. He would drink homemade liquor. He went crazy. So he went to work, and I was left with all this homemade liquor, just jar after jar after jar in the cabinets in the kitchen. So I knew I, that he would kill himself and maybe us and maybe you and your brother. So I poured it all down the sink. <laughs> and he came home from work, and the first thing he said was, where's my liquor? And she just reached and took her glass of sat down on the chair and said, don't hurt me. Now, it, so what I've tried to do, and maybe it's because of my physical, I don't think I am in a physical sense, but I think I might be a little bit of a mental literary writer, is I let the people I, I love, and sometimes feel, carry the hide behind those people in memoir the same way you hid behind them in real life. Mm -hmm. So so I think it's sometimes we, we try to make it that perfect and this great story of self exploration mm -hmm. when really we we kind of say exactly as much as we want to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Except maybe in your case where 
<laughs> you say all kind of weird shit. <laughs> uh, when Rick Bragg thinks you're the one saying weird shit, we're all right. in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, to answer your question, um, do memoirists return to their material and find things that they're surprised they want to write about? Yeah. I think that that's the essential thing that brings all memoirs to their material is curiosity. And I think we return to the past with a genuine question about something that we don't understand. Mm -hmm. And understanding it is integral to figuring out who we are and who our people are. And the people who don't return with curiosity are sometimes returning to, um, to make themselves look like the hero or to like avenge a wrong. And I think both of those motivations poison the work because you're driven not out of discovery but out of uh, a mission to shape your material and what happens is it falsifies it. And I think only returning with the, the true hunger to understand um, allows a book to come into being that could be of use. And what, what, what about you? Were you surprised by anything that came up for you when you were beginning to write? Yeah, I was actually very surprised at how um, kind of unself-aware I'd been over um, like the last like 15, 20 years regarding some of the things that had happened in my life. And um, I'd written a whole draft of this book in which um, my sisters, that I focused more on my dad, more on the readings, more, it was very, it was much more heavy on like literary criticism and, and the group. And, um, and my sisters would just kind of like pop up every, every now and then. Um, and then I was talking with somebody about it, and I was like, yeah, I said, and they're like, why aren't you writing more about your sister? I said, well, when, you know, my dad didn't, he kind of, he forbade me to write about my, my sisters. And, um, and I realized, I was like, wait a minute, Jesus, like, wait a minute. Like, I'd written them, this was like maybe two drafts in or something. And uh, I was like, that's, I realized, like, that's, that's what the story was. And as I was writing about my dad, like, there was a reason why they kept popping up. Because whenever you have a death in the family, all the other deaths, all the other ghosts kind of, like, reassert themselves. Um, in your consciousness, and so, like, their ghosts had been there all along, and I had been so, um, you know, like, kind of been so delicate about um, writing about my sisters over the years, because I didn't, I had no, I, it never seemed worth it to, like, try to, um, to hurt my parents or go against my dad's, you know, wishes, but then once he died, I was like, all right, well, then, you know, um, you know, it's kind of, I think there's a phrase in here talking about like um, respecting the wishes of the dead, but then you have all the, you have the irrational dead who had these kind of like irrational um, desires in life, and they asserted themselves on you. And so, um, yeah, so I was, ex I was really like I said, it was I was constantly having revelations about um, just how much I had not been dealing with things um, because I hadn't been writing about them. I hadn't been writing about my sisters and their and their deaths. And now, I mean, unfortunately. I hate that it took my dad's death, and I hope, I hope I'm not that kind of parent where like my sons feel like they have to wait till I die before they can do, before they can feel kind of free. Um, so yeah, so that was that was definitely, um, and then just like bringing me back, like you meant, I love that that metaphor of the uh, that that smoldering layer that's there for just like years and years, um, and when you like hit something and unearth it, and it is this kind of like visceral experience, I'm sure y'all have had it, like when you're like writing intensely about a memory and suddenly you can like smell the char, you can like smell it and, and feel it and um, that that came up a whole lot, um, those, those moments. Yeah. In New Orleans you had to go 230 years down to <laughs> find a place that nobody peed on. <laughs> I like to bring every literary event to a highbrow. <laughs> Raise that level. Hmm. Did you want yeah, to? I Go can. Ahead. I can certainly speak to that. Uh, I was. I was surprised by just about everything about my memoir and the writing of it, and and uh, Beth Ann's uh, thoughts about uh, uh, discovery and surprise. I think uh, it was so much a part of it for me. Uh, in, in just as one example in particular, um, after my mother's death, I received, as I said, just some boxes and boxes and boxes of these musty, dusty things of hers, her writings. And um, 
I have a lot of really bad dust allergy uh, problems. And so I was living in New Mexico at the time, and I had to take these out. I put up a card table in the backyard, and I took them out in the backyard, and I spent a whole summer going over them and writing and going over them and writing. But um, in particular, um, my mother's deep inner life uh, just moved me and surprised me in a sense because you, you know, when you're a child you, of someone, you just don't think of them as having as as deep an inner life as they do. And it it kind of she kind of spoke to me through all of these things. She wrote letters uh, to many other poets, and she would write to famous poets and and express herself to them, and they would write back. And so, um, and she would write to fledgling poets who were in her creative writing classes, and they would write back, and they would, they would exchange materials and all of this. And it, I just found that so powerful um, uh, to, to listen to her letters to other people. I also found, and this was, the, this was kind of an excruciating surprise uh, to me, uh, I also found um, all of my cards and all of my letters uh, to her after I had committed her to um, a mental facility unopened. Uh, none of them had been opened. And, um, and it was interesting to me to see, to open them and see what I had written to her after I had done that to her. Uh, and um, I, I had to commit her twice. I was the oldest, her oldest child. She was married to my stepfather, but what he would do is he would, um, and I live 600 miles away. I just had my first job at Virginia Tech after graduate school, and he uh, would call me on the phone and say, I can't take it, she's in the closet, she won't come out, I can't get, get her to do anything, you're gonna have to come down here and deal with her. And so, um, and my younger brother and sister were very damaged by her as a parent, and so they just could not cope with her at all, even though they lived much closer. So I would drive the 600 miles down, I would get the sheriffs to come and have to get her out because she was, the first time I tried to do it myself, she tried to stab me with a pair of scissors. Mm -hmm. So um, so her, uh, her voice uh, in these uh, letters, these friendly voice, you know, a, a collegial voice, uh, was really kind of wonderful for me, for me to be able to read and surprise me. So something else that um, that I've, uh, that I've, is true about you all as writers is that many of you work in other genres. Some of them, some of you come from journalism. Some of you write fiction. Some of you write essays. Um, given that memoir is as exposing as as it is, um, why choose memoir over an, an, another genre that you might work in, such as fiction? Um, why, why choose that, or what is it? What is it like to switch a genre? Like, why, why switch genres? What does that, what does that do for you, create creatively? Um. Sure. My training is in poetry. I published three books of poems, and I could read you some poems, and you would hear them, and you would guess they were probably about me, and you'd probably be right. But when we talk about poems, we always say the speaker in this poem, and we pretend that there's a distance, and, and actually quite often the, there is. A lot of people aren't writing autobiographically. Um, one of the things that I found actually oddly liberating about writing memoir was just owning the experience and just saying, and this is me. You know, just taking away the mask and, um, and dealing with truth telling. And I think I got more interested in that because of um, alternative facts and the age of Trump that I suddenly became very interested in what you can do with the restrictions of the truth. And I decided I wasn't gonna fudge anything. Like I wouldn't fudge the restrictions of a sonnet. Like a sonnets are great because 
you use the form to liberate something greater than you would have written if you didn't have the form. And I wanted to do that with the truth. Like I'm, I'm just using the, the made material of my life and I'll use it and I'll rearrange it and I'll find the magic in it. And the other thing that happened is I fell in love with a sentence. And I think that that would probably sound like a very <laughs> precious thing to say to people who are not in a room like this, like a room of real readers, because the difference in the line of the sentence is probably not much for people who don't read a lot. But for, you know, my whole life had been organized around the line before. And the kind of tension is in the line of the poem with, a, you know, a push and a pull. And every line reminds you that you're reading a poem because there's that break. And to move from that into the expansiveness of the sentence, you know, it felt like an entirely different kind of music that allowed me to find an entirely different kind of subject matter and um, a different kind of pace. So um, the sentence, I'm just digging on the sentence. Mm -hmm. And that's how I'm going to answer that question. Okay. Okay. That's yeah. a good one. Okay. All right. It kind of trailed off at the end there, but you're going to, you know. I, I dig yeah, that I answer. Know, you, everyone felt it. They're like, oh, oh, oh I'm putting my pen down. <laughs> Well, my only other genre is I'm a, I'm a failed poet, and I started <laughs> writing poetry, and I decided that well, I wasn't a poet, and then I started writing short fiction, decided I wasn't a short fiction. I wrote a couple novels. I wasn't a novelist either, and then when I started writing nonfiction, I was like, oh, that's, that's what it is. I'm a nonfiction writer, and I got to use all of the stuff that I'd been learning from poetry and fiction, and, um, and so it was a total revelation, and I love it. I love writing nonfiction, creative nonfiction, literary nonfiction, whatever whatever you call it. Um, but I think for me, there's not between the uh, like the the memoir and the the more personal, even more journalistic. I have written some kind of long form journalism stuff, but I never I never felt comfortable with the uh, the journalistic authority, the sense of like when you when you don't have the eye in there. And this goes back to kind of what you were saying about this this age of the alternative facts. Um, I was just always so so aware that these were my facts that I was gathering. Other someone else might be gathering a different set of facts and coming up with different conclusions from them. And so I feel like the only way to approach even the non more journalistic nonfiction was to have myself in there. It just felt like the most honest way and the most honest approach. Um, and so I think maybe in terms of my nonfiction um, or the personal essays, I kind of blur that because I make it very, very clear that there is an I behind what's writing, that I have a particular point of view. Um, and so I don't, I don't see this as being too different from what, from what I'm already, what I'm already mm -hmm. working on genre-wise. Mm -hmm. And I've already burned through all the other genres <laughs> anyway, so and I'm pretty, pretty committed to, to this one. <laughs> Poetry. <laughs> Tell us, Rick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> those those recipes are like poems, you know. Right. That's they exactly. Are. That's it. My my mom actually does poetry. She has a beautiful poem called "That Damn Phone," <laughs> written in a fit of anger because her phone rings all the time. And, and uh, but I. Uh, and I was going to say something nice about you, but I'm not going to say it now, so you just <laughs> sit there and be quiet. Please, but, but, please, but, uh, but a poet who is not Beth Ann Finley, uh, uh, and a, a poet named Ron Rash, uh, who is a you know, novelist. And, and, but there is, you know, you know grit and power and, and color in, 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 in that. A lot of poets. To me, is is like eating sushi. You know, it's 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 delicate, and it's and it's and it's and it's probably I'm just not sophisticated enough to really appreciate it, and and it just doesn't seem. It seems like there should be something else. And you're talking about the sentence, <laughs> you know, like there's a line, there's a line, and then there's another line, and then there's fourteen, fifteen lines, and it's. Sushi. It's just, it's just, you keep thinking, okay, there's going to be some soup here in a minute. <laughs> or, 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 or there is going to be a good salad with a good thousand island, you know. Or, and then maybe there might even be some meat. But no, no, there is no meat. And, and that just irritates the mortal hell out of me. And, so I don't, ha you know, I only got one. Hand. 
<laughs> to me, narrative nonfiction can be just as colorful and just as powerful and just as, as pretty as fiction. And so I don't think that if I, no matter what genre I'm going to write in, I'm going to write the same damn way because I'm too old to change. <laughs> I'm not going to say, you know, I think I'll try to do, I think I'll try to be more Cormac McCarthy like. <laughs> Well, I learned a lot from Cormac McCarthy, and I learned a lot from Larry McMurtry, and I learned maybe even a little bit from Faulkner, although that son of a bitch couldn't use a comma. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I learned from the poets that I read. You know, you learn the economy of life. And, but, but a good, yeah, a good sentence, a good long sentence with the right comma, man, that's <laughs> almost like, that's as much fun as you can have with your clothes on. <laughs> All right. Minrose, you wanted to say something about this. Anyway. Yeah, um, yeah. I, um, I I've worn several hats. I'm I uh, I was a um, well. First of all, I was a newspaper reporter. Then I became a literary and cultural scholar, critic slash critic. Then I discovered that my as as this this issue progressed with my mother and she died. I, um, I was writing more and more on mothers and daughters in, in literature and culture. And uh, I started just sliding these personal narrative into, into my scholarly work and my literary criticism and so forth. It just kind of started sneaking in there like a, like a, a stray dog, I guess. Uh, to um, to get back to dogs, and uh, and then uh, I thought I've just got to write this memoir. I've got I I, I I didn't think of it as a memoir. I just thought I've got to get this down. I've got to I've got to get my thoughts together on this uh, because uh, this is this is kind of getting out of hand in my other work. And once I did the memoir, I uh, I thought, gosh, you know, and and. He, got published and everything, and I thought, gosh, you know, um, maybe I could write a novel. <laughs> and so at the time, I was working on a book on, on the civil rights activist, Mississippi civil rights activist, Medgar Evers, and I started feeling like, well, I can't quite get the sense of this period in terms of the human complexities here and the messiness of it all. I think in the summers when I'm not teaching, I'm going to start working on a novel about this and set in this period. And it became, it became my um, first novel, The Queen of Palmyra. And so in any case, um, and then in, with Promise, my new novel, uh, which is about the Tupelo, Mississippi tornado, the historically devastating tornado of 1936 in Tupelo, um, that came to me through all of the stories that I heard growing up uh, in Tupelo. I grew up in my grandparents' house, and um, all of the, the wild and crazy stories that I heard uh, growing up uh, there, so it could have easily been a memoir or, or some sort of other form, but um, as those of you know, in New Orleans, uh, if you lived through Katrina, the in other or other hurricanes that after after a terribly devastating storm, there's this massive confusion and and uh, pain and anxiety and and chaos that comes with a de historically devastating uh, storm. And so I thought that I could best get out that with fiction. And so I've just kind of morphed along the way. Um, I've, I've written a few poems, but, but I am a failed poet, <laughs> I guess I would have to say. Let's hear it for the failed poets. <laughs> so um, this is the point where we invite questions from the audience. There's a, there's a lady in the back who has a microphone if you want. Raise your hand if you have a question. If you have a question. Hi, um, thank you. I, I, I'm, I'm writing a memoir, and I like to write dialogue. And so the dialogue is not 
accurate because, of course, it's remembered. And I maybe sometimes make it a little more colorful or a little more dense. Now, is the, does that then turn my memoir into fiction? Where, where, is, where, where does one draw the line? Yeah, I think it's a question of intentionality, which is to say all you're doing there is being a good writer by making the dialogue a little snappier or a little more to the point or taking out the ums and ahs. No one wants to read that. I think if you had the intention to misrepresent what someone said, that would change it. That's pretty much every job. Uh, mm -hmm. As long as you... I interviewed uh, the beloved uh, former Louisiana football coach, Nick Saban. And... Um, <laughs> And, and Nick it talks like a CEO, you know. It, it, modern day football coaches aren't like Mayor Bryant. They don't grumble some genius. You know, they talk like CEOs. And, you know, it's a journey and it's a process and all this. And we must be invested in, you know. And, and so I, I talked to him for a couple of hours and got a paragraph. <laughs> So I used the magic of the ellipse, where in journalism you don't have any wiggle room, and, but you know, but you can leave out, and as long as you don't change the intent, even by journalistic standards, that's all right. Trim, cut, as long as you don't change the intent, you don't insert words that didn't, you know, arrive in in narrative nonfiction memoir. Uh, obviously, you not there. Much of what I get is is third person, and this is the way I do my interviews. Well, what he say then? Well, he said, "Get off the porch, you son of a bitch." Mm -hmm. And 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 then what did he say? And then what did he say? And then what happened? And sometimes I will, and this drives a good editor crazy, but I'll weave in that. You know, I'll kind of be, I'll have a narrative or an episodic section, but the best of it is that dialogue. And third hand, 80 years old. Third hand, 80 year old dialogue. That's the only way to do what we do. That's the, yeah. Yeah, it's just you have to, you have to use the remembered material. There is no other way because unless you are writing about doctors, lawyers, society mavens, captains of industry, unless you are writing about writers, then there is no written record. So, as I say, you know, my people didn't get in the newspaper unless they knocked some rich man off his horse. <laughs> so, I, I, we have to rely on that, and I think that's, I think that's okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because you want it to unfold as it happened. You know, the first uh, first chapter of, of this this new book is is that journey on that you know, mule back into the mountains to fetch his daddy, my grandfather, to get his father. And you know, at one point he almost died from a, a wild pig that like ran across. How do I know a wild pig ran across the road? Because that's a good story, and that story was told over and over and over again. If I had turned a wild pig into a rhinoceros, <laughs> not only would I lose credibility, but I don't think there have ever been any rhinoceri. <laughs> and what's, what's the plural of rhinoceros? Rhinoceros, maybe? Shit, I don't know. <laughs> well, there's never more than one. So, <laughs> well, I've actually, and this is a true story, and I know this is exactly the direction he wanted this question to go. <laughs> but I have, yeah, you, you, I would say use it and don't worry about it. I used to have a good friend who'd say, sometimes you just got to put the shit on the page. <laughs> and, uh, and I, uh, but I, yeah, but, but, but that th wasn't a problem of dialogue. Right. Yeah. And, and, and here's the thing you have to, well, shit, I was going to tell the story about petting a rhinoceros, but it's too <laughs> late now. We've already gone in another direction. Aww. But I, I think 
at the end of the day, when you read it out loud, you ask yourself, does it ring true to the time and the people? If it rings true to the time and the people, if it rings true, if, if at the end of the day you ask yourself, did I get it completely 100% right historically? You know, I have to proof all my books against history. You know, if they're griping about a president, then I need to make sure he was in office. <laughs> you know, and, and I think as long as you do those things and you're... Yeah, and I, th I also think it goes back to intention, which was right. the point that, that Beth Ann right. made, which is that a memoirist has to be constantly examining her or his own conscience and asking, why am I right. writing this? Am I trying to make myself look like a big shot or guiltless, or am I really trying to bring the best, truest story? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and no one's going to know that except you. So, yeah, uh, I, I, uh, what, what I found myself doing, uh, two things. Uh, one is I did use some indirect uh, dialogue. That I think that's kind of helpful sometimes when you're really not sure what somebody, you know, you think they said this or whatever. But what I found myself doing, and as I progressed, and my memoir took a really long time to write. I didn't know what I was doing. I really didn't know what the heck I was doing. And so I was, I was you know, just fumbling around, really. Uh, but um, one of the things that I did was I would, um, I would question my own memory. At points, I questioned my own self. And sometimes the evidence that I received, like, three years after my mother died or my stepfather died or whatever, mm -hmm. the written evidence showed that I was off. And I wouldn't take that out of the memoir, but I would I would point out that fact, you know. And so, really, in my memoir, you can't really quite believe every, anything I say because I've set it up that way, you know, because I'm always questioning myself, um, uh, be, uh, mainly because of the subject matter, I think, of, of, of what I did. But, I mean, those are some of the, those are just kind of specific ways that I, I dealt with what you're talking about. Anybody else have a question? Other questions? I was just wondering if in the process of your writing, uh, if, if you're writing your memoirs, if any of you ever came across a, a story or an antidote that you felt like needed to be told, but there was a person involved that you felt needed to be protected. And how you went about doing that, whether it was just a name change or you did it some other way, and how effective you felt like it was after the fact. Sometimes the name is the least important element. <laughs> Some t I, you always ask yourself, it, what's it worth? And I don't mean what's your book advance. I mean, what's it worth? Is it is it worth hurting anybody? And and you know, and then you ask yourself, all right, it is worth putting in there, but it's not worth hurting anybody. So, it's to me, it's very easy. Uh, the name vanishes. And it becomes the boy down the road or the cousin twice removed and protect them that way. You can also just hope that they won't read your book. <laughs> I, I had a cousin. Uh, I'm not making this up. I was going to do a reading in my hometown. And, you know, being the only Democrat to walk out of Calhoun County, Alabama, uh, you know, my people have forgiven me that horrible liberalism and, and still come to my book events in my home county. But this time uh, in, the, in the auditorium, which seated 700, one of them had threatened to kill me. told one of my cousins who told one of my cousins. So we had to have security. And, and the security, and, and I said, well, how was he going to kill me? Because, you know, 
how sh shooting me from shooting me from a, a distance is a terrible thought if you live out in the country, you know, which we do. I mean, if you were like trying to feed a Hereford and somebody shoots you, that's a grim way to go. But but he said, no, no, he wants to get right up on you. He wants to cut you. So this is my cousin. I'm not making this up. Carlos Slats, <coughs> named after. Yeah, named named after. No, Carlos wasn't going to cut me. Carlos warned me of the cutting, and 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 he he was named after a box of Mexican apples his daddy bought in 1937, and the only Carlos in all of the mountains of Northern Calhoun County. But he, true story. He he said they're going. You know, your cousin cousin so and so is going to cut you and. I said, well, should I worry about it? And he said, well, he's mad at something you wrote in your book. And then he said, then come to think of it, he can't read. <laughs> and, uh, but I had to do the whole talk with these big old, and I'm a pretty good-sized boy, but these you know, Alabama is a, law enforcement, they Memoir is a big. dangerous game. Yeah, so they <laughs> did the whole talk, and then, they, then he didn't even show up because it would have made my writing career <laughs> to have received a minor flesh wound yeah. <laughs> and, and then wrestled the knife away from him because he'd have been drunk. <laughs> that would have made my right in life. I, don't, you know, I only wanted to do two things in my right in life. I wanted to meet Dolly Parton, you know, and, and, and fight for my life at a writing thing. <laughs> and, and now Dolly Parton's all bone and wire and, and and I'm getting too old to fight back. <laughs> that probably wasn't a question. No. <laughs> I think we have one minute left. Are we done? We have one minute. Well, that ought to just about do it. <laughs> <laughs> Can I answer a really quick question? Um, okay. Well, I didn't realize I just had a minute. Um, no pressure. My my question, maybe for um, Beth Ann, um, about micro memoirs. I just wondered, um, not I haven't read your book, but I I wondered if it's possible or what your opinion is on sort of stringing them together, so that you know you could have a, a collection that would add up to a memoir, and just kind of the, the structural problems with that, sort of having to introduce your reader to what you're talking about, so they so they wouldn't get lost and feel like they're eating sushi, you know, that kind of. I want to buy Rick some sushi and read him some poetry and see if I can't change his mind. <laughs> Just got to get that out there. Regarding your question about these little tiny pieces, did I think about linking them? Later, some people suggested, like, oh, did you want to do that because maybe you would have gotten some, like, fat cat advance if you had had this big, you know, arc of the memoir, but it just wasn't what I was interested in. And I also wasn't interested in the fragment. Like, I'm, I don't want you to have to read one, and it only makes a kind of sense until you read another, and then it makes a little more sense. And, you know, I was actually just interested in packing everything into as small a space as possible, just like gunpowder. And so um, I, I love fragments. You know, Claudia Rankine is doing really interesting work, Maggie Nelson. Um, and, of course, I love a memoir that has a giant, beautiful arc that you know, relays our experience and you see the writer looking back on their life like, you know, you pick up breadcrumbs dropped in a forest and um, through the moments that are selected, telling us something beautiful about the life. It just simply wasn't my project. I was interested in um, getting in and out as fast as possible, having as many different emotions as I could, having as little backstory as I thought I could, and um, trying to represent as much me as possible in as tiny space as I could. Unfortunately, we are out of time. Thank you all for coming. Thanks so to our panelists. They'll be in the bookshop two doors down if anybody wants right to keep talking. Oh, really?